Welcome to the beginner's guide to extending the functionality of Balancer V3 pools using hooks. To follow along with the code we're about to walk through, check out the links in the description below. And now let's get started by writing a simple hooks contract from scratch. The plan for this hook is to apply a 50% discount to the swap fee for users that hold VBAL. But first, let's go over the fundamental requirements for all hooks contracts starting with inheriting from base hooks, which is an abstract contract that implements the iHooks interface, where all of the pool hooks function signatures are defined along with helpful NAT spec for each one. So let's head back to our contract and take care of the base hooks constructor, which requires that we pass an iVault instance. Additionally, there are two virtual functions from basehooks that must be implemented. The first is onRegister, which determines if a pool is allowed to use this hook. The way this works is that pools must be registered with the vault using a hooks contract address so that the vault can call onRegister. If onRegister returns false, the register pool function will revert. But if onRegister returns true, the vault will store the hooks contract address along with all the necessary configurations. So let's follow the principle of least privilege by only permitting pools deployed by an allowed factory to register, which can be done by declaring state for an allowed factory and setting it through the constructor. So that we can compare the address of the factory that is calling register pool to the address of the allowed factory. And then import iBase pool factory to ensure the pool was deployed by the factory. But how can we be sure that onRegister is functioning as intended? Well, the easiest way to do that is to write a test that inherits from base vault test, which defines a ton of useful state, including mock instances of all the core V3 contracts, as well as a number of helper functions some of which can be overridden like create hook, which runs in the setup of base vault test to set a pool hooks contract address, which means that we can override create hook in our test suite by creating an instance of the discount hook and returning the address. Then we can write a helper function that orchestrates pool registration with our pool hooks contract, which nicely sets the stage for testing registration with the wrong factory by creating a pool creating an unauthorized factory and expecting the transaction to revert when attempting to register using the unauthorized factory. So let's pop open the terminal to execute the test and we see that it passes. And then to test a successful registration, we can create a pool, register the pool using the allowed mock factory, and then read the hooks config that gets stored in the vault to see if it matches the pool hooks contract. So let's run the test to see that we are successfully registering a pool with our hooks contract which means we are ready to discuss the second required function for all hooks contracts, git hook flags. And what's important to understand about git hook flags is that it's also called by the vault during pool registration to define which hooks a pool says it supports. And it does this by returning a hook flags struct that is simply composed of booleans for all available hooks, with the caveat that you must enable hook adjusted amounts if you want to modify amount calculated in any of the hooks that run after a pool operation. But we don't need to worry about that for our swap fee discount hook because we can use should call compute dynamic swap fee. So back in our hooks contract, let's make sure the get hook flags function sets should call compute dynamic swap fee to true. And then to test that, all we need to do is add an assertion that checks the hooks config from the vault. So let's run the test again and see that it passes. All right, now that we have verified our hooks contract is set up to use the on compute dynamic swap fee percentage hook, let's check out the function definition in iHooks, where the first thing to know is that this hook is called after the on before swap hook, but before the main swap operation. And to illustrate that point, let's check out this visual, which shows that the vault is the caller of the hook and that the hook sends back results to the vault before the vault moves forward with the main pool operation. And to guarantee that the vault is the caller, we recommend using the only vault modifier. The other important thing to note is that there are two return parameters. The first is a Boolean that controls whether the transaction will proceed or revert, and the second is the value of the swap fee percentage as an 18 decimal floating point value. So let's grab the function signature, to paste in our hooks contract and then add the override specifier and only vault modifier. 
And now the logic we want to write is, if the user owns VBAL, apply a 50% discount to the swap fee. But how do we figure out the address of the user? Well, going back to the visual for swap life cycles, we can see that users send swap transactions to a router contract whose purpose is to handle the complexities of operating with underlying vault primitives. So to find the address of the user, we just need to grab the address of the router from the pool swap params and then create an instance of iRouter common, which comes with a helper function named get sender. However, it's important to note that this helper function simply gets the first sender which initialized the call to a router, which means that it can be manipulated by malicious routers. So to protect against that vulnerability, let's declare a trusted router address and set it via the constructor so that we can prevent any swap fee discount by returning true along with the unadjusted static swap fee percentage if the router passing along the call is not the one that we trust. And now that we have a reliable user address, the next step is to figure out if they own VBAL. So let's declare state for a VBAL address, set it via the constructor, and use the IERC20 interface to check if the user's balance is greater than zero. And if it is, let's reward them by slashing the static swap fee percentage in half. But if the user holds zero VBAL, they deserve zero discount. And with that, the logic for the hooks contract is now complete. So let's move on to testing the three possible swap scenarios, which are swapping with an untrusted router, swapping with VBAL, and swapping without VBAL. So over in our test contract, let's start by laying out the three test cases along with a reusable helper function that executes a swap and checks that the discount is applied only when Bob is using a trusted router and has VBAL. For test swap without VBAL, we just need to make sure that Bob has no VBAL and then execute the swap and check using the trusted router. Then for test swap with VBAL, let's mint Bob some VBAL so that he's able to receive the fee discount and then do the swap and check using the trusted router again. And then finally to test swap with VBAL and untrusted router, we can mint Bob some VBAL, create an untrusted router, have Bob call permit2.approve with the untrusted router as the spender, and then do the swap and check using the untrusted router this time. And then to implement the swap and check, let's start by arbitrarily setting the static swap fee percentage to 10%, and then define an exact amount in and an expected amount out, which starts off as equal to the exact amount in, but is adjusted downward by the value of the expected hook fee, which can be calculated by replicating the logic of the hook. Then we can use this ultra convenient get balances function from base vault test to get the before swap token balances for Bob, the vault, and the pool. And now we are finally ready to execute the swap by calling swap single token exact in on the mock router with die as the token in and USDC as the token out. Then we can grab the after swap token balances and check to make sure Bob's die balance decreases by the exact amount in, Bob's USDC balance increases by the expected amount out, the vault's die balance increases by the expected amount in, the vault's USDC balance decreases by the expected amount out, the pool's die balance increases by the expected amount in, and the pool's USDC balance decreases by the expected amount out. Now we are finally ready to run the swap tests, and voila. We hope you have enjoyed this tutorial and can't wait to see what hooks you cook up next.